<laughs> so welcome again, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Always just in the nick of time. Oh. So, <laughs> so here is my analogy of why soil testing is just not optional. So if you've had the great privilege and pleasure of snorkeling on a barrier reef, you know, you're like, you can sit on a boat on the Great Barrier Reef and be sipping a margarita and you can say that you've been on the Great Barrier Reef. Sure. But you know, if you've got, if, if you've raised your hand, if you've had a snorkel on your face in the water, just having your mind blown. And you know that if you have been on the Great Barrier Reef, but you haven't been snorkeling and like immersed in the water, actually seeing the life below the surface, that really, I don't know, have you been to the Great Barrier Reef? It's perhaps debatable. And so, which isn't to say you're gardening if you're not soil testing. <laughs> I don't mean to be that bold or crass. However, soil testing is totally putting on the snorkel and you can have a darn fine time on any body of water <laughs> from Canandaigua Lake to the Great Barrier Reef on your pontoon boat with your margarita in hand and you can garden your entire life without soil testing and it's great. <laughs> But I highly encourage you to dive, put on your snorkel, get out your shovel, send in $20 along with your soil test, and suddenly this entire different world will come into view. And it will take a few years of really getting to know kind of what is a soil test and how do we begin to adapt and adjust and then to see the outcome after it. But I mean, there are weeds that are send clues. There's lots of different indicators that are above the ground that we don't need soil tests to ascertain. But that being said, I'm a really big fan of certain aspects of the 21st century. And this is one of them. You know exactly the micronutrients and the macronutrients that your plants have available and certainly the pH. And also the soil test will look at, they'll ask you about the last three to 10 years, if you have it, of information of what was being grown in that soil. They're looking at that history, which I so admire. And they're also asking you, are you wanting to grow blueberries here? Are you wanting to grow cane fruit? Are you wanting to grow just garden vegetables? So depending on what that goal is, you absolutely want to be treating your soil differently. So they're asking you what you want to be doing with your soil, giving you active recommendations. And I don't want to lie. There are, there's a ton of information. You can get a $200 soil test too. And there's so much information that makes my home, my brain just absolutely explode and implode all at once. And it's a huge learning curve. So even at, with a $20 soil test, likely you'll receive it and be like, I know Petra said this was so important, but mm, can you help me? I am, I have, I've been meaning to for some time. I haven't yet made a blog that's like line by line, the standard cooperative extension soil test, the $20 soil test, what each line means. And if it's above this number, do this, if below that number, do that. So I'm excited to accompany us all in that way as well. And so I'd love to give you just a, this little clue of when we soil test, of how we soil test, and then how often, and then some details for containers, raised beds. So when do we soil test? You can soil test any time, January to the following January, like what you can literally, anytime you can dig soil, which <laughs> we probably can't do soil testing in January. <laughs> but if in your North Carolina, you absolutely can. So you can literally test any time. But here's the thing, two things. In the most people soil test in spring, when it's like, snow is melting and we can be sowing peas. Oh, I probably should soil test. You and 5 billion other people, or maybe 500. 
I don't know, but enough other people are having that exact same thought that suddenly cooperative extension is inundated. And so it generally takes about six weeks to get a soil test back in the spring, where it generally takes us less than 10 days two weeks max in the fall. So there's just way less soil testing happening in general in the fall. So we tend to do it in the fall. And then we get the test back. And then when, it ha when you get it back in the fall, you have all fall, winter, early spring to actually be planning and adapting and amending, planning on how to amend your soil. Where if you soil test in April, get the soil test back in mid to late May and then like lots of things are growing <laughs> and it, you don't have that much time to adjust for that season. So whatever you do, just make sure that you are, if you're, if you do a soil test in the fall, every time you do a soil test in the future, make sure you do it within two or three weeks of that same time. And here's why that's important in the same cup of soil at different temperatures, there's going to be different levels of nutrients and different even biological, certainly biological activity, but even the pH can be a little different depending on how much organic, a lot of variables. So if you do it in, in spring, just always do it in spring. Or if you do it in fall, always do it in fall. We soil test every year because it's our job. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of paying us to be soil stewards, really. If you're like giving us dollars so we can share organic, regionally adapted seeds with you, <laughs> the seeds are great, but they're only a reflection of the soil that they grow in and a reflection of, you know, thousands of years of indigenous brilliance. Well, we want to make sure that we are growing soil first and foremost. All of our vegetables, flowers, herbs, honestly are secondary to that soil and the fungal networks and the organic matter that we're building. So we absolutely, it's kind of our religion <laughs> to be soil testing among other things every year so that we can always be making the soil more resilient. For home gardeners, I recommend once every three years as kind of a minimum. If you wanna do every year, I won't stop you. And probably you'll be so grateful you did. I feel like every three years is a really good way to just like see big trends or small trends before they get to be bad trends. So those are my formal recommendations for time. Can you open the door for me please? <laughs> and uh, I'm going to walk you through yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, to soil test. So again, when I first, when I first did my first soil test and in my father's garden, I grew up in my father's garden here in the Finger Lakes and we never tested the soil once. <laughs> so we had a lot did. I am now unmuted. Yay. Um, so I'm not sure where I cut off, but in my father's garden, I just want to be really honest. We never soil tested once. <laughs> so if you never do once, I won't judge you and you'll probably still have lots of abundance. So please d know that that is always an option. So by the time I'm working on organic farms in my late teens and I'm doing my first soil test, I was definitely like, oh, I'm going to mess this up wow, I'm really nervous right now. This is kind of a big deal and I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> so it's really simple. And like anything, you just have to do it a few times. And then it becomes, if not second nature, something that's genuinely fun and curiosity driven. And you'll have a much better sense of just how hard it is to mess this up. So here's the thing, three steps. You want to dig one foot down. You don't want to take the top of the soil and honestly, digger, bigger, <laughs> digger, <laughs> my favorite po poet of all time. Um, you don't want to go deeper than a foot because at that point, you're probably getting into the sub layers of soil. So, but a foot down anywhere, honestly, if it's eight inches, that's fine. Put this in the category of 
if it's at the same time of year, October, you're getting actually the same reference point of pH of general available nitrogen of general available this and that and the other thing. And so you want to, if you are, if you can only really get six, eight inches deep, that's great. Just make sure that you make a note of it. Um, insert the shameless plug for fruitions. <laughs> across the seasons perpetual calendar just make a little note for yourself so that you know ah yeah I just did six inches so in the future it can be six ish give or take inches as well so that right it's a really nice reference point from year to year and you're not going really switching up the variables so you'll dig one foot down when the soil isn't wet you want to really make sure that you know, any, any time, like all day, I was going to actually do our soil test today so I could bring you different bags and show you how I combine them and this and that. And I look at the forecast all the time, but I didn't, I totally forgot to do that. <laughs> and it's been raining all day. <laughs> so I have no soil to show you. It's all hypothetical, which is all to say, if it's raining, don't do your soil test then let the soil nicely drain. And another reason why we do it in fall, early October, but not any later here in zone five, it's just going to be a waterlogged scenario for the rest of the season, really. It's with the temperatures lessening, there isn't as much evaporation. So it takes the soil longer to dry. So you will want to be digging your soil at a time when the soil is nice and light, and more friable. And here's the thing. If you have a big garden like we have 20 acres on our farm and there are oh my gosh I should have counted before one two three four there's at least 12 like distinct areas where we are farming that are separate soil types and we're managing kind of as separate blocks and so honestly we do soil tests for every single one of them because we're managing them separately and so we want to be getting the soil test individually. If you have, you know, a 10 acre field and you're just, you'd only want to be managing it as a single composite, you would make like put, get a bunch of different samples for 10 acres. I might do 15 or 20 soil tests, but honestly, even for our little, like a two acre plot, we'll get eight or 10, even for that. And then we'll make a composite of those, mix them all up. And then we'll send that off as a single soil test for that single field. If you have just a smaller garden, honestly, if it's less than like a hundred by a hundred, I would probably, and certainly if you're just managing it as a whole, if it doesn't have specific subsections, maybe if you have an annual portion or a perennial portion, um, you could totally just feel, you can absolutely test it as specifically as you love, but try to find, we always try to find that balance of how are we managing soil similarly and just getting a composite of lens, a little snapshot of that soil for that moment and sending that in as a representation of the whole. So if you notice that, you know, if you all of your raised beds, if they all started with the exact same materials, feel free to just use that as the, as the material, as the same with a single test. But if they came from different if your soils came from different places and or if your gardens, if your raised beds are like dramatic, if one is dramatically less abundant than another, I would definitely go ahead and get a separate soil test from that so you can really see what's going on. And yeah, so then once you get that composite for any given soil test, you want to just send in a scant, a cup of soil. And so we'll put it in a, in a Ziploc bag, we'll zip it up and you'll see, um, oh, and perhaps, I don't know if you saw Stacy, I sent um, a link to every extension office that uh, in the country that you can send samples to. So Stacy will pop that in the chat. And then um, you'll also find that information on Fruition's blog, our soil testing made simple blog. And so then you can find your soil tester, your local extension office most close to you and, and then send it off. And it's 
very exciting. There is also a video that I shared in our um, in our fruition, in fruition soil testing blog that is from extension of exactly how they want you to do it. And they have a lot more detail in there that honestly, I kind of ignore. There's some details on that in the vlog. And they include like ascending in your sample with ice packets. We never do. <laughs> just keep it simple and everything will be just fine. Um, <laughs> and we always, they, they say to, to send it expedited shipping. We never do. <laughs> That's why we send locally. Um, but yes, so all kinds of little details. And I won't stop you from putting ice packs on it and from shipping it overnight. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so many, so many other little details. But maybe before we dig into kind of the more composting portion of our evening, maybe now would be let's take a moment for some Q and Q around soil testing specifically. Um, so yeah, if you want to type any question into the chat, feel free and Stacy will share them. And so, thanks in advance. Our first one is from Vicki, who wonders, is there a fix for too wet compost in a drum composter? Um, and then she has EnviroCycle in parentheses. Do we continue to add it, add to it over the winter? Awesome question. Well, maybe, maybe if there isn't, if there aren't more soil testing questions, we'll dive right into compost. Um, so it's kind of the soil testing portion of our evening and then the compost section. Let me just um, scroll through and see if I see anything. Do you want one about garden cleanup? Ooh, maybe, maybe that's perfect. That'll be a nice little transition. We'll do a garden cleanup and then dive into compost. Um, also from Vicki, she's wondering, we used leaf mulch this year, which worked very well to keep weeds down. Turn it under, uh, turn it under along with any soil amendments, or leave it and pull it back to make amendments. Mm, you've got lots of options, and deciduous leaves that aren't like walnut are my absolute favorite mulch and garden amendment of all time. And anytime you can incorporate them into the soil is just marvelous. They'll break down that much faster. And especially in fall, that means that their nutrients will be that much more available for your crops the following year. That being said, tillage is just not great. Anytime you can avoid tilling, please do. But if you happen to be tilling, definitely throw all of the deciduous leaves in that you can so you're incorporating them. Broad forking is a really nice intermediary. So broad forks, or even if you don't have a big broad fork or if you just have like, you know, a pitch fork with those long thin tines, you can just simply like open up some area, like aerate the soil a tiny bit. But honestly, earthworms are gonna do their thing. That's, the, that's what they love most. I mean, essentially earthworms are plows, to be honest with you. Um, on a macro scale, they're absolutely just turning soil over and burning through organic matter a lot faster than bacterially turning soils. Um, so yeah, you can totally, if you don't, if you're not already planning on broad forking or tilling your garden, fabulous, in which case just leave them on top and or put them straight onto your compost pile. And on, if you have all the leaves in the world and you have lots of neighbors, if you're anything like me, bagging them up for you, it's so convenient. Um, put them on your compost and on your garden. Um, I really love incorporating them. And well, I have a fun little tip to share um, about leaves and in compost for fall too. Um, Sheila has a question. Do you do a zigzag method with your soil samples? Oh my gosh, I don't know anything about the zigzag method. So I imagine the answer is no, but I would love to learn more. And if you can put a link into the chat, then I will love to look it up and learn more. And so can everybody else. And yeah, also if you are a really big fan of it, and want to come off mute and share and teach us all about it. 
um, please dive right in. Take a couple minutes. Um, Anthony has a question. I'm not sure where it fits in, so I'm just going to ask it. Are no, no. certain leaves more acidic than other ones? Ooh, that's an awesome question. Well, certainly there's coniferous leaves, which pine needles are technically botanically leaves. So certainly pine needles are very coniferous. But it's a really good question. Deciduous leaves? I don't know. Um, some are more tannic, like oaks have more tannins than maples, for example. But I don't know how that translates to acidity. And oh, I'm going to make myself a little note to do some homework on this. Anthony, I love that question. Um, another question while you're writing, Sandy's wondering, is the test for organic content useful? It's usually an extra fee. Oh, oh, that's so obnoxious that it's an extra fee. Pardon my indigence. Um, the thing that I love about it is it's kind of without looking at all. Yeah, I, oh, I just can't imagine a soil test without it, honestly. So here's why it's like the organic matter is kind of the everything all of the other everything else about the soil test is just kind of this like the buttresses that make up this totality of here's help the you know, like if you're there's one single if there's two single barometers of soil health that i really want to know it's ph and my organic matter content and so it's also i mean at this point maybe it's my ego too i just love to see every year like are we building our soil organic matter and and we are and it's like so deliciously prideful <laughs> on the one hand and also it's like so, I'm so proud of our soil and so grateful for it and and it also is um yeah just this really helpful like indeed all the things that you are doing to, I mean, you can like do this and that to shift the pH and this and that to build if you need more potassium, you wanna see that reflected, but it's that if, there, if there's a baseline health for your soil, it's the organic matter and it, that's it. So I don't know, it would be painful if it was like 50 more dollars, but that's just so weird. I've done plenty of, so organic matter test, like it shouldn't be a large, it shouldn't be a large fee. Yeah, you get very if less than ten dollars, I wouldn't think twice. Um, but I'm excited to do a little more homework and maybe shop around and see what other tests you can find with different extensions. Maybe they have different services and tests. Certainly for for ours, it's all included and. That's my long way of saying you want the soil organic matter. <laughs> just so you know, Sheila said that the zigzag method is just to get a better sample of your soil in garden beds. And she had helped um, an extens extension cooperative agent collect a few soil samples for homeowners in this way. So just a little. Oh, that's awesome. I think as I'm imagining, yeah, you're like getting multiple samples within an area and then making a composite so that it's more, the sample is more representative of the entire area rather than that just single, you know, data point. Um, yeah, totally. I love it. The zigzag method. <laughs> Absolutely. And the last question is, how do you winter over your garden? <laughs> oh, there's no one way. But here's a key to keep in mind. Soil blows away. If you haven't already seen images and footage of how soil blows, or if you've never been oh, driving past a field in the fall when it's being, you know, or in the winter and just seeing the soil blast off into space. It's certainly humbling to watch. Ken Burns has a brilliant documentary on the Dust Bowl. And so while you're not exactly going to be like Kansas in your Northeast garden, you do wanna be covering your soil for the winter. 
those winter winds will carry away more soil than you realize. And so much of what you're doing is building your soil and your soil organic matter. So you want to keep your, you want to keep your soil in place. So whether that's, you know, on a larger scale, that's where cover cropping comes in on a smaller scale and what small scale i don't really know but like less than 100 by 100 and certainly less than like 50 50 50 by 50 like just you should get a lot of lovely leaves and then put those deciduous leaves on top of your soil so that they can be insulating and covering. And here's the thing, if you are putting lots and lots of leaves on and it's dry and then it's windy, they're just going to be blowing away. So if it, I love to put them on. And then if you, if you have an easily available hose to just hose down your leaves so they get nice and wet and start to and just stick together then you can be sure that you're covering them for the winter like bonus 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 points putting leaves through a chipper shredder is amazing comminution is just like increasing the surface area of your leaves or of anything so that it break there's more surface area for bacteria and fungi to do their thing to be breaking down more and so if you can put your leaves through a chipper shredder and then put them on your garden, more of those leaves will be actively integrating into your soil. So it'll be acting not only as a mulch, but as a garden amendment, a soil amendment. You'll be building soil faster with that chipper shredder. And oh my gosh, I saw Joe said, did my question get skipped? And I just want to be sure we get back to Joe's question. Yeah, I, I have Joe's questions. I asked Joe to repeat her question. Hey, Petra. Oh, oh there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so good to see you. You look so relaxed. <laughs> oh, well, that's a very nice word for exhausted, but thank you. Um, <laughs> One of the many things we have in common. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the rain. Um, uh, before I ask my question, I'll, I'll say that because I'm a cheapskate um, for shredding my leaves because I don't want to pay for a shredder, I just use my little electric weed whacker in a big plastic leaf bag, like a like an immersion blender. Um, but wear your wear your COVID mask because you'll breathe it all. <laughs> I love it, Joe. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love one of those sweat mulchers you dump leaves into, but they're expensive. So that's another season. But my question was that um, every time I, and it may just be because I'm not reading it right, but every time I check Cornell Cooperative Extensions soil test um, options, like the basic, basic one is like $70. And um, I'm just, again, too cheap to do that. And so I was wondering whether, it's because I've got a lot of different areas. Um, I was wondering whether those over-the-counter little self kits are any use at all. It seems like, are they better than nothing? Or? You know, I haven't done one of those kits in 15 years. So I feel like I don't, I can't really speak to it. Um, certainly if it's just telling you pH, that's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. And I've seen your gardens, Joe. You have such beautiful gardens. Honestly, I- If, if you like fungus. <laughs> and I do. I, I, think, I think because you have such beautiful, robust, I mean, such abundant gardens, I, I would just, if, I think with, with your pH, um, just getting a general a sense of pH to make, the, make sure things aren't way off. Um, mm -hmm but chances are they're not super way off. I mean, when I look at your gardens, I wouldn't be too concerned, um, but I'd start there. Okay. Um, and, and I'm excited to, I'm going to make a note here too, to go get one of those. <laughs> I love the over the counter <laughs> tests and yeah, I'll totally, I'll totally do an over the counter test on the soil that we're about to dig and send into, you know, Cornell. So then we'll get to see what does the over counter to the test say? And what does oh. the expensive test say? So, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. These oh, are the eight so much. tests that I love <laughs> in life. Um, any other questions or should we dive into compost? 
I just have a couple one, a couple more. Susan's wondering, how do you cover crop a tiny garden? I, it's a good question. I might dissuade you from it, honestly, in favor of simply putting lots of deciduous leaves that aren't, that aren't black walnuts on it cover cropping because you kind of you want to you have to prepare the soil enough so the seeds grow evenly and 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 then depending how you cover crop and when like especially if you want to have be growing lots of vegetables into the fall and then want to be growing vegetables early in spring it really doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to be trying you it's going to be hard to establish a cover crop and then in spring if you're going to be like, wait, I just want to plant things now. So that's maybe at the risk of there's definitely deeper questions that we could ask and dive into with that. Um, but my knee jerk response would be go for the rather than a green living cover crop, go for just covering the soil with the most juicy, dynamic nutrients you can find that are called deciduous leaves. <laughs> Um, Paul is wondering, in a chipper shredder, do you prefer straight leaves or a mix of leaves and twigs? Ooh, it depends. Thanks. I love you, Paul. Um, if it's in going in our garden, it's all leaves all day. If it's going in our compost, bring on the branches. So yeah, if it's, yeah, but those branches, those little tiny pieces of branches chipped, shredded are still gonna tie up lots of labile nitrogen. And I don't want that in our garden where in our compost, it's gonna be awesome. Our compost is that way. <laughs> <laughs> One more pop up. Mary is wondering, um, because she might've missed it, but do you take a test of a, a certain area of your garden? Yeah, many certain areas. We take us we take a specific test of every single one of our high tunnels, every single one of our fields that we manage as an entire field. So that might be a half acre field, it might be a four acre field that we're managing as like an entire field, field, field. So we take multiple samples from within each of those spaces. And, our, and we create a composite so that we're just sending one cup of soil that represents each of those disparate locations where we're gardening. And so, yeah, we definitely take, we take many. <laughs> I think that's it. What fun, awesome. Uh, well, let's dive in um, to our last 20 minutes just digging into compost. So I just have some notes on um, kind of the most common mistakes and like quandaries that people have around compost that I thought I would start with. And also just a little note as well, Fruition has a whole little mini course um, called Composting with Confidence, where you'll find um, this info and so, 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 so much more, including lots of fun stories. Um, our child, my childhood compost was very special. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll find that as a free online course on our website, fruitionseeds.com. And so if you haven't already dove into that, please do. Um, but from the top, let's dive into the sogginess first, because I remember that was a question from earlier. And so here's the thing, sogginess is definitely on the harder side to address. And often it's about placement. So choosing, if you haven't yet made a compost pile in your life and you're considering it, and on in our compost with, composting with confidence course, you'll find some keys on just how to decide, like where do you put your compost pile? There's lots of considerations, who knew? So one of them is, you know, to not put it in a low spot. So that will decrease the sogginess and to also be putting it like your compost on a pallet. If you have access to untreated wood that's, you know, hammered together in the pallet form, that's a fabulous, start the compost on top of that. In lieu of that, we, when I was growing up, we had a compost pile on this, like just 
big pile of sticks that we had created that we just drug out from the forest. So you, the idea here is that there's both aeration and drainage. Um, at the bottom. So you've got air <laughs> right at the top of the compost and it will drain down. So the harder part is to get aeration so that you're not anaerobically <laughs> fermenting your compost, but fully aerating and oxidizing and truly composting your compost. So to have that air built in at the base. So if it is in a, just a soggy place, and I think um, so just choosing a place with, that isn't in a low spot that has um, that, you know, something to raise it up off the ground. So there is that drainage. I have this vague remembrance that with this specific question earlier, it was around, it was like in a barrel composter, which is definitely harder to address, but mostly you just have to put in lots of the brown materials, lots of the carbon rich materials. So whether it's, you know, go for the sticks, go for the leaves, don't go, go for the brown things. You can even use, you know, like newspaper clippings as an option technically, but they don't, you take, it takes a lot for it to go anywhere. And I'm always just really skeptical of all the prints and all the like inks and dyes and things. Um, so yeah, go for the carbon rich materials. And just as a quick little, just backup, 15,000 foot view on compost. In, in composting conversations, you'll hear people talk about green materials and brown materials. There's a lot more about this in the composting with confidence course. As a general rule, green things are green, brown things are brown. But beyond that, the green is the nitrogen rich materials. So like if it's kitchen scraps, it doesn't matter. If it's an orange carrot, that's actually green materials in terms of your compost, it's very nitrogen rich, where the brown materials are very carbon rich and they tend to be the dry leaves, the branches, the straw. So in those brown, that brown gold continuum. And so if you are, if you have lots of sogginess, adding lots of, if you can find it, straw is fabulous and those deciduous leaves that aren't your juggalone laden black walnuts is a wonderful way to, to approach it, especially with those big barrels. Um, so yeah, and if you haven't chosen a site already, just site choice is everything. And another common, and feel free, I forget who asked that question. If that didn't fully answer your question, feel free to jump in the chat and um, let's, keep, let's keep diving into the soggy compost. Um, another thing that I wanted to lift up is unpleasant odors in compost. So that is a sure sign that you have too much nitrogen rich, too much green materials, and also that there could be some anaerobic um, activity. So your solutions there um, are to add more carbon, carboniferous, that more of those brown materials, so straw, deciduous leaves, even twigs, um, and then to turn them in, which you want to do anyway, rather than to put them on top, to actually be addressing that pungency, you want to be turning them in. So that will naturally be your aerator as well as just incorporating those carbon materials. Um, another thing that people often ask they're really concerned about the fact that their compost is steaming and it's always fun because hooray your your compost is alive that's actually a fabulous sign <laughs> that your compost is doing exactly what it wants um, and that brings us to kind of just i wanted to lift up hot and cold composting because when i was a girl our compost was definitely a cold compost i never saw our compost steam ever. <laughs> I saw more possums scampering away with our compost than I ever saw steam. <laughs> so <laughs> if you can still see like pieces of who knows what in your compost six months later, you have a cold compost and that's okay. It's going to compost. It will just take its time. Hot compost is physically hot. Like it can be 150 plus degrees and it needs to be 170 to really like 
Nutri-Kill than weed seeds. Um, otherwise, compost can very, cold compost can be totally laden with weed seeds. But it takes a lot of material to be actively creating hot compost. So that's where, honestly, it's really challenging to get enough material of those brown and green materials to have a really active hot compost. But if you can, it's going to just, just absolutely, you can literally, our friend John has all of, he has a composting business and he can take just like, like great big branches and be breaking them up and breaking them down. And I mean, crazy, he brings dead cows <laughs> into his compost. And six weeks later, there is no trace of bone or, or anything of that cow. That's how hot his compost is. So that's the other end of the spectrum, right? So just wanting to lift up that, um, that hot and cold phenomena. And this fun little tip for fall that I learned from our, stand, our friend Stephanie. Um, and I just love it. So she incorporates leaves and branches into her compost just before it's really significantly winter. And here is her observation. And we've given it a, tr a try on some of our smaller compost piles. And I mean, I'm very susceptible <laughs> to bias and wonder and to just wanting things to be <laughs> that I want to be, <laughs> as are we all perhaps. And so it, it seems, it totally tracks, although all of our, it's totally anecdotal in my experience. But here's the thing, she's taking leaves, not sent through a chipper shredder, but whole leaves and then branches as well. Nothing big, but smaller branchlets. And then she's adding them to her compost and not just putting it on top, but kind of working it into her compost pile, turning over the con that final time she's turning the compost. She's actively working all of these very bulky and yet light carbon brown materials into her compost and it's like a down jacket right down jackets brilliantly house air in such a way that it captures the insulative capacity of the air and so then it allows her compost to be that much warmer over the winter and thus the biological activity is that much more happening. And that way also the air is that much more abundant. So the oxidation is also happening. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of different approaches, but that's been one of my greatest revelations of the last few years with a compost pile, especially a smaller compost pile that you'd really love to keep composting, even though it's winter, even though there isn't a ton of material there. Um, yeah, another, another facet that I'd love to lift up, um, is just what compost really means to me. Um, it's really easy to talk about these just nitty gritty, more practical um, facets of composting. And for me, I just love walking past our compost every day and just being reminded that the things that I don't need, the things that I think I don't need, the things that I'm ready to let go of, the things that are stinky are no longer serving me the shit really, that that can yet be life-giving, but it has to be let go of. It has to be not ignored and I have to process it. I have to turn it at just the right time or at least occasionally. <laughs> and compost is just this beautiful metaphor for life and especially of gardens. And so I just love this invitation to remember that there's so much we need to be comp that I need to be composting in myself, in my understanding of myself, in my understanding of the world. And so, yes, gardens are just brilliant growers of us, much more than we grow them in so many ways. And so just an invitation to let your compost compost you. <laughs> um, Stacy, what? Fun questions do we have in in there? 
let's go with Nancy and Ralph's question, which is, <laughs> I've just finished lasagna gardening a long area and have rough branches, chips, and leaves to top the areas. Should I top it off with finer leaves and wood chips? All are from my gardens. Leave the wood chips. Don't use the wood chips. The leaves, yes, the wood chips keep separate. If you wanna start creating another space, like a more Hugel culture kind of space that is like starting, that is going to be a lot more material and like more composting than like garden bed, then that's where to put those materials. But honestly, wood chips on gardens are just, they look so beautiful. <laughs> and then they just tie up lots of nitrogen and other minerals as well. And so it's really important to actually counterintuitively just put the leaves on, but don't incorporate um, those wood chips or like pieces of branches. Put those in your compost or create, you haven't already looked up um, Hugel culture, kind of this brilliant indigenous, you know, that permaculture has made very, you know, famous approach, um, H-U-G-E-L. Um, and often it's spelled like culture, like in German, K-U-L, um, you are. Hugel culture. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad you asked and I hope we've averted the <laughs> crisis before it even started. Um, Susan's wondering, when do you compost in the fall? Oh, well, I mean, admittedly, we're composting every day. <laughs> every day that I'm like, well, that's another carrot top I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> every day we're composting um and if the the best time to start a compost is today or perhaps tomorrow if the sun has already gone down as it has today um so honestly it's not a bad there's never never a bad time to start a compost it is harder to start a compost in the winter especially um and especially you know it's like we have a there's a neighbor a few a few of little ways away that um i they i don't actually know i think they do consider it their compost but they definitely are feeding the neighborhood skunks and possums and poncho and davi our little dogs are just so delighted every time we walk past their house we're like we get to practice heal because <laughs> otherwise they are eating everything in that compost pile. So it's very easy in fall and in winter to be creating not so much a compost pile, but a scrap heap for the skunks, um, <laughs> which is maybe a reason to not, or to, you know, just make sure that you're getting, you have lots and lots of leaves on hand so that every time you're adding something, like we would definitely, my mom, would send me out to the compost pile um, with the compost and we had this old rusty shovel right there that it was just our dedicated compost shovel and every time we'd put something on it we added something to the compost we would just kind of you know put some sprinkle some compost on top so it would start to work in and compost that much more quickly um, but there were plenty of times where I was like oh, I'm just busy <laughs> <laughs> and put it on and that's when you know we'd be walking past at night and the raccoons would be scurrying away <laughs> um Angela I think you've answered Angela's question but um she's new at composting and so wondering if she can still add food waste in the winter it's cold where she lives it can go down to minus 22 so it sounds like if you put lots of leaves over food you can still do it Totally, totally. Yeah, if you've got an area, I mean, at that point, you're, there's plenty of times where we're putting our kitchen scraps out in February, and we're just, we're not incorporating them at that point. We're just, I'm sure under two feet of snow, it's not in fact frozen, it's still warm. But at that point, we're just throwing it on. And, and it's honestly, I love watching the tracks of animals in snow. So I will totally like just go up to our compost pile. And I love being like, oh my gosh, that was a least weasel. And like looking at like figuring out who all those tracks are is part of the fun of the compost too. So chances are in the, in the winter, you're not going to be your kitchen scraps, for example, 
your chances are they're they're going to be going into the bellies of other mammals um, unless you have a barrel. Adrian doesn't want to look at animal tracks. He wants to know how to keep them out of the compost. <laughs> <laughs> and put it in a barrel. Otherwise, there's basically, I don't know that there's a good way to keep them out. Um, you know, even if you're just putting it up on pallets and like you can, often you'll see lots of designs for like here is, you know, a pallet and then a pallet, 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 pallet. So it's like, but you know, the mice are gonna get in. It's just like part of part of their part of their lives. Um, so yeah, but if you I would recommend if you don't want if there's absolutely no no animal you ever want to see <laughs> that has four legs and is vaguely mammalian, <laughs> uh, that just getting one of those larger composters, the barrel composters that are um, that you can exclude them from. Sounds good. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. I would love to hear because I'm sure there are other approaches. Um, Paul's question, I think you touched on earlier, but some people have suggested using shredded paper as a as a brown material in the compost. Is this a good idea or not? It's not the worst, but it's not the best. Um, I I never do mostly because we are no shortage of brown ourselves, but mostly, but also too, I'm just a little, I'm a little skeptical of all the inks and dyes on paper. So I'm, I'm happier for it to be, for those materials to be recycled than for them to be like put into our compost. Um, but I'm, yeah, I don't know that it's not like, I would just hesitate to put any like glossy print materials in, uh, but otherwise black and white probably isn't the worst. And yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts on that or any research that anyone's seen, I'm curious to do some more homework on it. Susan wonders, is there a proportion of green to brown that is best? Oh yes. Um, so two to one brown to green is great. Um, especially, and that's for hot compost. So if you want to be having, um, yeah, that hot compost that is actively composting quickly, having two parts green to one part, two parts brown to one part green is ideal. And once you start to get a sense of, of, the, of the process, you're gonna be probably really surprised and delighted by how your intuition will kick in. Because if it's just kind of sitting there and like it's a lot of leaves, but like is not really moving fast, um, it's not really transforming, then, you know, you need green to be breaking down that brown. And by contrast, if like, it's really getting stinky and like, you can still see the peels of things, but like, it's just kind of getting slimy and sludgy at the top or in the middle, you have too much nitrogen and not enough brown, not enough um, carbon. And so you'll likely get a great <laughs> pardon Poncho and Dobby as Matthew comes home. <laughs> Welcome home! <laughs> um, so yeah, you'll get a, a really that two to one brown to green carbon to nitrogen ratio is what you want. And in lieu of that, your eyes and your nose will be a great, <laughs> a great uh, asset to you. She's wondering if she's just finished lasagna gardening in a large area of formerly overgrown bushes and weeds, and the top layer is made up of small branches, wood chips, and leaves. Should she top it off with compost or finer leaf mold or chopped leaves and wood chips? I think that's a different question. Mm, I would leave, I would, I would go with the compost for sure. And the leaf mold. Um, yeah, the wood chips leave aside, but yeah, that sounds like a beautiful area. And like, you've put a lot of thought into how this area is transitioning. And like, you've got a lot of branches just in that area, um, which isn't the best, but it's not the worst. And especially if you put on lots of compost now and leaf mold now in the fall, it's going to be turning over and transitioning really quickly. Um, 
if compared if you didn't do that. Um, so yeah, I think you've got a great plan, my friend. Sally's wondering, do you cover up the compost pile? We don't. We don't. Yeah, we let it just always be oxidizing and you want that airflow always so that it's, um, yeah, that air, those, you want to be like aerodynamic, like aerodynamically is not the word that I want, but you want to be aerating your, that soil constantly. If it starts to not have good airflow, that's when it starts to putrefy, I think like swamp bog style. Um, Sheila has heard conflicting advice on whether or not to put citrus scraps in her comp compost pile. What's your opinion? Oh, that's a great question. And there's, admittedly, you'll find a, a whole piece about this and so many other pieces in our um, free online course, our mini course, our composting with confidence course on our website. But basically in a cold compost where you have not, not nearly as much material that's composting and it's not steaming, it's going to be really hard for citrus and banana peels to break down quickly in those scenarios or at all where a hot compost that's actively steaming and turning over really quickly your citrus peels your banana peels your like dead cows are going to be just fine and that's where too like you'll see um dairy is on a list on the list of like things to not put in your compost and that's generally because people have colder rather than hotter composts. In hot compost, you're good to go. Um, but if you're cold, if it's taking more than six months for your compost to break down into that black gold, you've got a cold compost and it's best to keep the citrus out. Nancy says she had added spent grain from a local brewery which was hot but now she has a million flies help <laughs> yes so turn what is that song <laughs> uh, there is a season turn 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 <laughs> yeah. so um add lots of it's interesting because grain is generally more carbon but i think there's something that happens if it's from a brewery a lot of the starches have been like transitioned into sugars in the fermentation process so the spent grain is coming from a brewery is actually going to be higher nitrogen than carbon which is kind of a counterintuitive little scenario. So, and that checks out generally flying insects when, when I've seen there being lots of flying insects, that means there's lots of green materials. <laughs> so add carbon, add the brown materials. Here we are, happy October, bring on the leaves and just turn them into the soil, into your compost. And that should instantly be shifting their life cycle <laughs> and their happiness there. So within a day, I think you'll see a big difference. And certainly within a week, you'll probably have uh, truncated the entire situation. Sheila would like to know, do you put animal manure in your co compost, like chicken or other farm type of animals, not dog or cat? Mm, yeah. So it, it depends. If, um, if it's hot compost, anything goes. Um, and if it's cold compost, you can. You just want to make sure that you are really then attending to that manure is going to be very green, even though it could be brown. It <laughs> is a lot of nitrogen. And so you want to be sure that you're getting lots and lots of those brown materials, straw and leaves, and even twigs. <laughs> Susan says last year she covered her garden with leaves, but it seems to have created a problem with slugs in the spring. Is there any way to avoid this and still use the leaves? Oh, yes. It's such a, I love this Mal Malcolm Gladwell quote, advantages are not always advantages. Disadvantages are not always disadvantages. <laughs> and mulch is just one of those things, which essentially compost is and leaves are mulch. And so they are just absolutely condominiums, like the most desirable <laughs> real estate for every slug on the planet. So it's kind of 
amazing for compost and crucial for it. And it can definitely be a slug habitat. To make it less of a slug habitat, you want to be managing that two to one ratio that much more and turning that much more often. If you're actively turning it, it's going to be, they aren't going to live in it. They're not, it's not been a luxurious condominium. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's my two cents. <laughs> Sarah wonders if sawdust is okay in the compost as a brown material. Oh, totally. Just make sure, you know, we also, there's um, a local craft, like, furniture maker and a lot of their sawdust is laced with like they're take they're like they have like mahogany veneer on like plywood and stuff so sometimes just be careful um sometimes sawdust in fact can be a lot of other things besides just wood so um if it is just wood awesome and i would also caution you if it's coniferous if it's softwood if it's pine especially pine fir um then that's going to be really acidic and not the best for your compost so I, it's great, totally awesome brown, but there's a few caveats. And I'm remembering, I see, I think I saw Joe asking like a fleeting comment that I saw um, on the chat about wood ashes. And yep, that was the next question. <laughs> oh, really? Oh my gosh, amazing. Um, there's a lot to be said. And I think there's a whole section about this in the composting course. Um, I'll put a little bit of our wood stove ashes in our compost, but mostly I'll put it down on like the driveway and somewhere else because the, even though there's a lot of great nutrients in there, it tends to be very like, it can change the pH really quickly on our compost. So I tend to, alas, not use the, the wood ash um, more than a couple times over the winter. But that's a thing too, where I don't, I haven't done soil tests on our compost that on this particular compost pile where we add it to. So I'm now like, Petra, how about you do this? And then you'll know. So maybe we'll have two different, com I'll have two different composts where I add lots of, lots of wood ashes to one and none to the other and see how it shifts. Are you ready for the final question of the evening? I'm so ready. <laughs> Is it possible to put too many leaves in the compost pile? Mm -hmm. Only if it's not balanced by enough nitrogen. So if it's too many leaves, then it's just, they're not gonna break down. And that's not the worst in that then you have this great mulch pile for spring. So if you're wanting to mulch your peas after they emerge or after you know, the garlic is eight inches tall and you wanna put more, more mulch on it, or if you're the, like, I like to have six inches of mulch now in the fall on our garlic. And then as it starts to break down and just compress and in the spring, it might be down to like two or three inches. I'll put on another three, four inches just so it's like, always mulched so I don't have to weed it ever. <laughs> um, so the, if it does not break down, then use it as mulch. Thank you, Petra. Oh my gosh, thank you friends. Thank you. Happy composting, happy soil testing. I am so entirely delighted yeah. <laughs> to be in conversation. And maybe I'll end with that Wendell Berry quote. I love to end as we begin. And so I love these words from Wendell Berry. If a healthy soil is full of death, it is also full of, of worms, of fungi, of microorganisms, life of all kinds. And in healthy soil, nothing that dies is dead for very long. Cheers, friends. If, uh, Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Have a nice night. Mm -hmm. Bye.